So have you ever wondered why cat and dog owners keep on feeding the wrong food to the pets that they love? You know, we all know that convenience food is bad for us, but why have we inflicted it on our pets as well? So I'm here today at Nurturing by Nature, and I'm going to find out just why we get it so wrong and what we can do about it. I'm joined by Nettie Plath, who's the founder and dietitian of Nurturing by Nature, and by her daughter, Emma. So Nettie, tell me, you know, what was it that first triggered your interest in natural pet food? Good morning. Uh, it was really the fact that it didn't feel right. All this carbohydrate was not something that dogs would naturally eat. So why were we feeding it? And that was going on from that. There was also an awful lot of illnesses that seemed to be appearing that were not necessarily something you'd expect to see. So it's just really, and, and it started off with that sort of niggling doubt. And so how did that, how did that niggling doubt kind of develop in your, in your mind to become you know, what is today a successful business? It's really a question of um, trying to make things better, mm -hmm. trying to improve the situation, but not really understanding what the problem was. So, in those days, we were told, basically, if it didn't come out of a tin or a packet and was labelled dog food or cat food, you can't feed it to your dog or cat. I suppose we'd all been brainwashed into believing that that was the truth. You can't feed it unless it says it's dog or cat food. You can't feed human food. I guess it's one of those things that, with, with hindsight now, seems blindingly obvious that, that if you think back about where cats and dogs have come from, what their natural diet would have been. Yet in those days, we were somehow um, brainwashed into manufactured prepared food. So what, how did you go about researching it? How did you go about unearthing all this, this information? It was not easy in those days. There were the odd articles that came up and also there was a book that came out at that time. Do you remember it? The one with regard to animals actually self-medicating and... The zoo farmer, Konoski. Yeah. Yes, I think we had that book, yeah. And you didn't exactly have the internet to rely upon like we do nowadays. No, so it would really have been a question of articles that you managed to come across. Mm -hmm. Um, word of mouth from a few people. Did you perhaps have a bit more insight because you were working at a veterinary practice at the time? I would say that helped, but not obviously from representatives from pet food manufacturers. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> or even pharmaceutical manufacturers either, because their main interest was to resolve whatever the problems were, mm. not necessarily why those problems occurred. Yes, so it's about getting back to the root cause of the problem. The, and and yes. from your research, this, this seemed to be very much a root cause that was based on diet. Yes, yes. And it, it seemed to work right the way through, not just with animals, but with humans as well. So there was a correlation we knew between, it was becoming more and more apparent, between carbohydrates, sugars and cancers. And of course it was really triggered when Fred my boxer got his first bout of cancer. Okay, so tell me, tell me about Fred and how, how that's, that situation developed. Fred, I think, was about six years old when he got his first bout of cancer. Um, and it was sort of a, an absolute shock. It was a shock because I thought I was feeding him a good diet. It was not, uh, it wasn't, it was a proprietary diet, so it came out of a dry, packet. Uh, he, he would have a few bits and pieces as well um, and never expected him as a fit and healthy dog of his age to end up with cancer but of course boxers can be a little bit prone to cancer. Certain breeds tend to be, have a bit more tendency to get certain, certain cancers and unfortunately Fred was one of them. 
So that was his first bout was, at, was at, when he was about six. So how was that, how was that treated? Surgically. 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 And, um, and that was it, really. That was all the advice that, that, that was given in those days. Um, feed a good quality food um, and we'll cut it out. Yeah. Cut out the, uh, the offending item, shall we yeah. say, and the tumour. Good, good quality food came out of a packet. Yes, yes, because the vets were also selling uh, veterinary diets which had been manufactured by the bigger pet food manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So then did Fred, did Fred have, further, have further bouts of cancer and further problems? Or? He was fine for a year or so, and then about two years later he developed another, another tumour, which was devastating, because I thought we'd been doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was at that point when I was really lucky that um, we had a a vet who'd come to work at the vets where I was working, who'd come in from New Zealand and he was a little bit more alternative. We actually thought he was quite funny. Mm. But, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, when watching the, the, the customers go in to see him, uh, they'd come back out and they would say, oh, he's a bit different. Um, we'd be nosy, as you always are. You'd say, well, what, what, what did he say? And they'd say, oh, well, he, he's given, he's gave the dog an injection um, and he's given me some tablets and a diet sheet. And we didn't know anything really about this diet sheet, but it was actually a raw diet that he was advocating. And when you saw the difference that those dogs went through, the improvement in their health, mm. it was basically, it was before your eyes, wasn't it? So that led you to then think about raw diet for Fred? Yes, mm. yes. And that was where it really all, all started. It took me a month, so I went to see Tony and I said, Tony, what's this raw diet you're talking about then? He said, well, basically you've got a third meat, a third vegetables, and if you want a third, some oats, you can add oats. And I said, well, what's the oats for? Because I don't want the carbohydrates. Because mm -hmm. I'd always already had come to the, the, the idea that the, the carbohydrate was the one that we wanted to avoid, because that's what turns to sugars, and that's what most cancers feed from. So I said to him, well, what about the carbohydrate? He said, oh, no, that's just the filler. You don't have to put it in. And I thought, that's it. That has to be the answer. Yeah. And it did. It really, really worked. But it took me a month to get over it. So I said, well, where do you get it from, Tony? And he said, oh, you have to phone up these people for the meat and you can get there's a few pet food or pet food manufacturers or dog meat manufacturers. They weren't pet food manufacturers. Dog meat manufacturers. And you can get some from them. And then you go down the market and you get all the bits and pieces off the, off the vegetable stores. So it took me about a month to get my head around it. And I thought, right, we'll give it a go. And Fred looked at me and said, hmm, where's my dinner? <laughs> and I said, Fred, this is your dinner. And he said, no, it's not. Where's my dinner? My dinner's dry. I don't eat this much stuff. So we had a small argument for three days. At the end of three days, I was going, Fred, this is going to save your life. And he said, yes, OK, but where's my dinner? And in the end, I picked a handful out threw it in his mouth and he went, oh, this is all right. And we never looked back after that. So when he was eight years old, when he went onto the raw diet, and he lived till he was nearly 14 and a half wow. without any more incidences of cancer. So it was, and he was really quite fit and healthy till he was, yeah. Yeah, didn't he? <laughs> So what happened, what happened next then? So having had that revelation uh, in terms of how the raw diet you know, transformed Fred's life, how did you then take that forward to you know, the business that we see today? Well, Fred went on to the raw diet and then all the other cats and dogs went on to it. And there was improvement in everybody, in all of them. It was um, obviously the one thing you do notice is the poo, much 
less offensive, shall we say. Uh, but they all improved in one way or another. Usually if there was a problem with that animal, it seemed to resolve those issues. And um, that was it. You sort of said, I thought, well, everybody should, know. why don't people know about feeding raw food? Why, why is this not a general given? Because years and years and years ago, you know, great grandma or whoever was around at that time, the dogs weren't given promote. They had whatever scraps they could have. Yeah. But also those dogs were not contained, so they would also go off scavenging and hunting for themselves and then arrive home probably just after tea time when there might be a few scraps around. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's one of those things you never never think about. It. What, what did, how did people feed their cats and dogs before there was prepackaged? Available. There's, there's, there's the answer. So what happened in terms of, of moving this then from out of you, you know, feeding your own animals to then finding that other people wanted to follow the same journey? It was quite funny really because it, Tony was still working at the vets where I was working and um, he was still doing the same thing, you know, minimal treatment and a diet sheet. And of course the, the inevitable question was, where did we get this from? And the answer was, oh, go and see Nettie, she'll get it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it all started. And one, I think my earliest customer is still with me. She still comes and gets wow. dog food from us. <laughs> that's fantastic. So you then, you then began producing, you know, creating raw diets for, for other people. Yeah, so it was more, it was more I would buy it in. Mm -hmm and sell it on and we did make vegetable sort of mixtures as well so that was that was the basic of, of the diet then we were lucky enough to improve it by obtaining bones and carcasses and all sorts to give the extra um, benefits and the, be the extra interest as far as the animals are concerned. So this, and this was all being done out of your own kitchen? Yes, yes. Started off in the kitchen, and then, then there was freezers in various places, uh, in the garage, and in the shed, and in the utility room, and then in my mother's garage, and then in my aunt's garage. <laughs> so we got to the point where there's rather a lot of freezers in various areas in, in and around the Ferndown area, shall we say. No, it became obvious we couldn't really continue like that. Well, once, you, once you've used up all your, your relative garages and freezers, then you, you presumably had to move the business somewhere else. Yes, it became obvious at that point, really. Because I used to do delivery rounds, uh, mm -hmm. delivery round, um, but I was still working not in the vets anymore because, unfortunately, that had, had, had closed. Mm -hmm. But um, I was still doing a few bits and pieces for... Uh, other people and um, it would the the deliveries would inevitably be in the evening mm -hmm. which wasn't too bad in the summer but where I was delivering to was unfortunately very rural yes. very spaced out mm -hmm. very dark and not a lot of potholes yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't an easy it wasn't an easy thing to go and do those rounds but then I was, it was a, an ironic situation that I was going to visit my mother and the road was closed and I drove past the shop, that, which is now the one at Westmore's. Gosh, so it was a chance, a yes. chance find. Yes. But having, having then got the shop, that was where you then established the business. That's right, yes. Fantastic. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about you know, the process that people go through when they, they think about switching their diet. So, Emma, can I bring you in? You know, what's, what's the first step that people need to think about when they consider switching to a raw diet? Well, it's usually done out of a need, or well, it certainly has been done out of a need up until a few years ago, because people were then looking into what's better for their pet because their pet's poorly. Mm. 
and that was, I think, a lot of the people used to come into the shop and mum used to be able to help them. Um, but now, I think, overall, people are a lot more aware of what they eat, so therefore they're more aware of what they're feeding their pets. Um, and most people want to do the best to improve it if they are aware of it. So once you know about it, you can fix it. Um, so realistically, we use species-appropriate food. So we've got a dog. A dog could naturally catch, kill, and eat a chicken, for example. So we base our diet a lot on a chicken. Um, we didn't, wouldn't encourage everyone to feed the same protein over and over again, continuously. So we expect people to vary it over time, but it doesn't have to be done every meal, you know. So you don't have to create a beautiful culinary delight for every single meal. You can if you want to, and if that's your passion, then absolutely fine. Sure. But it can be really simple. And sometimes people do overthink it a bit, but really it can be very simple. Yeah. So a nice, simple, raw diet based on chicken is what we use. But like we say, more proteins over time because you do need different amino acids and different vitamins in from other places. So that's why we uh, advocate using chicken and starting on chicken. So a minced chicken for a starting base is really good because it's already broken down for the pet. So be it a cat or a dog or a ferret, they can eat that easily. Um, doesn't smell either, which although um, might sound obvious when you had a bit of chicken in the fridge, you wouldn't want it to smell. Cats and dogs kind of like things that are a bit more smelly, so if you open a bag of kibble and you stick your nose in it, it's not usually a pleasant experience. Mm. But actually, you'd be surprised when you defrost our chicken, there's hardly any smell to it. So encouraging the dogs to eat it, or the cats, can be a bit tricky to start off with. But we've got tricks and tips to help people do that, so. So is it, is it, is it just usually a kind of gradual changeover or, or a sudden switch or, or what? It is completely up to your own circumstances. I, if you wanted to do an instant switch over and you're like, that's it, I don't want my dog eating that rubbish food anymore, I want him to have the best. You could do lots of small meals throughout the day and increase the amount they have and then decrease the meals they have. Mm -hmm. So you increase the volume of the meals, but then decrease the amount. So we can do it over that, over maybe four or five days. Mm. Or you could also bring it in where you have a small raw meal and then um, their basic other biscuits or tinned meat that they were having beforehand, and then gradually increase the amount of raw they're having, decrease the other food. So you can do it as a transition, or you can do it as sort of cold turkey. Whichever, whichever works. <laughs> And does, does it depend very much on what they've been having before and the way you manage that transition? Not really, because the raw diet really appeals to the pets, so overall they do tend to wolf it down. And it's easier for them to digest, isn't much it? Much easier. Yeah. yeah. So how, how soon would you, you expect to observe a, a noticeable difference in the pet when you make that switch? Almost instantly. instantly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is. Yeah, or well, you see it in their feces. So when they have a poo, you can definitely see the difference from what's gone in as to what comes out. It, it makes an almost instant difference. And also it's surprising how quickly the coat can change. It can get really soft yeah. within a very short space of time. I can remember when I changed Fred over, within three days his coat felt softer and silkier. Yeah. And I thought, actually, I was imagining it but you ask anybody, and if their dog's been on raw for a week, yeah. or their cat. Well, we had our, our old cat, Pip, she would, she was a bit of a madam, so we had to have a bit of an alternative. So although we know the raw diet's best, we also um, used a really good quality biscuit. So sometimes she would use, she would eat that. She wouldn't entertain a tinned or pouch food. That, that was a no. Um, I also used to have to put her raw food down frozen so she'd go and choose to eat it when she wanted to. You couldn't, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it really. But she'd go through phases where she'd be happy to eat the raw food mm -hmm. and then other times she would leave it. Um, and when she was on the raw diet, you could feel her coat become softer almost overnight and she was a bit arthritic and she didn't click when she walked when she was on the raw food. Just like that. Wow. That's amazing. So, so 
what are the common misconceptions that people have about raw, raw food? Bacteria, isn't it? I think people think you're bringing salmonella into your kitchen. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't advocate taking a slab of meat and smearing it across the worktop. Mm. We treat it as if we would treat our own raw food in, in, in the fridge. Mm. So you keep it separate to your vegetables, you keep it in a leak-proof container. And I think that's, I think that's mostly the problem. People mm. think, oh, raw diet, you, you're going to make yourself ill by feeding your pet that. And some people will let their dogs lick their faces. You know, mm. we just, they maybe wipe their face down, mm. um, wipe, wipe their beards off or mm. something beforehand. But, yeah. <laughs> dogs do horrible things anyway, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think is, is a misconception, Nettie? people on this changeover to raw food? That's really, um, you know, the bacteria is one of the, one of the big issues and that can actually be it said time and time again, but because of the protocols that we've got in place with bacteria testing and the controls that we have, um, our food is actually, can actually be a lot safer than even stuff for humans because we have to jump through a few more hoops um, so that's that's that side of it they worry about having to keep it separate from their own food um, but it is actually quite safe within the same freezer because it comes from the same food chain yeah. although once it gets to us it becomes a different category uh, which is to do with rules and regulations um, and the fact that they think it can turn their dogs vicious. Oh, yeah. I was going to say about the bones as well, but yeah, the giving your dog a, a raw meat diet, you can make them bloodthirsty. It doesn't happen. In fact, because it's what they're naturally evolved to eat, it actually calms them down. Yeah. Because they're not getting stressed trying to eat something that they mm -hmm. find difficult to digest. So, in fact, you end up with a karma dog, which we've noticed on quite a few occasions. Yeah, it gets their, gets their tummy a chance to settle so that when they're resting, they really can rest. Yeah. And I think the other thing people do always say, we say you can feed your dog this chicken carcass or a chicken when they're all, no, you can't feed animals bones. They'll choke and die. Mm. And then we have to explain it's not, it's not, not the raw bones. The raw bones are fine, they're spongy. Yeah. They're digestible because the dog's stomach acid is capable of coping with that. It's when you cook a bone, that's when it's dangerous and you should never ever feed cooked bones, no. whatever form. Many, many years ago, after the animals had been on raw, just for a, sort of about a month or so, we went my own, mm -hmm. the ones we had at home, I got a load of chicken wings. I thought, I'll give them a chicken wing, each or two, or depending on the size of animal how many chicken wings they'd get. So I gaily sort of dolloped them all out and then had a wobble. I said, oh gosh, I've killed my dogs. And I can re it was a real anxiety. And for 24 hours, I thought, that's it, I'm going to have to get them all operated on. It's going to be a disaster. And it, it wasn't, it was, there was absolutely no, the only person worried about it was me. They all digested their food, and they all didn't have any issues whatsoever. So it just, you know, it, we can overthink things easily. It's quite reassuring to know that, that even when you were looking into it, you worried about it too. So having worries about feeding a raw diet <laughs> is, is quite natural. People will have a list of things they always ask us. It's strange that people will worry about feeding a raw diet and not worry about feeding you know, over-processed, manufactured diets where you frankly have no knowledge as to what really is, is behind it. Yes, that, that, that does go down, you know, that the more you learn about the raw feeding, the more obvious it becomes, really. Mm -hmm. um, and you still get the situation where if the dog has an upset tummy, they will almost automatically, <laughs> yes, yeah, they'll blame the raw food, must have been a bit off, um, or um, maybe he picked up something in the forest. Well, that's that's another, another issue, and then they will they switch to 
yeah, cooked egg, rice, mm. maybe cooked fish. There was, you know, vets or people in practice tend to revert back to a to that diet. Even uh, where I've worked in practice, um, they go home and give it a nice bland diet of this tin of something disgusting. Mm. And, oh, um, yeah, so and I, I remember working in a vet's in Bournemouth with my mother-in-law, Sue, mm. she's our veterinary nurse, and um, she used to do the weight clinic. And there's a certain brand of dog food available in the supermarkets, which is a complete diet. And um, it's a, a sack of, of colourful kibble. Mm. And you could tell before the customer told you what the dog was fed by the look on it, look of its weight and the coat condition, mm. that that's what its diet was. Yeah. So. Wow. So... <coughs> When, you, when you've got a customer that, that's making this transition, how do you support them on, on their journey? How do you help them through this, this switch of diet? Well, what, what we usually try and do is a, a week by week so that they get used to feeding raw chicken for the first week and maybe a few vegetables yeah. alongside it. And then the second week, we start to introduce other protein sources, yeah. which are usually mixed with the chicken, so it's not a great big other protein. Most dogs and cats cope with all the raw food, but there are preferences. Not all cats like fish, and not all dogs like venison. You know, it's what they what they enjoy. But if you introduce one protein, new protein mixed with chicken in the morning feed and then go back to chicken for the rest of the day, then you know whether or not that food's going to suit them. So we can do that, but that we've got, we've got a far greater range than they will ever introduce in a week. So that's going to be an ongoing factor. There's various ways we can support our customers. So those lucky enough to live local to us um, can come in store mm -hmm. and we can talk these through with them. We've got a consultation service that we offer for a bit more in-depth. Those people that really need that hand-holding experience, we can do that one-to-one. -one. And we, you know, as far as customer service goes, we aim to give you the best. So we, if you need the hand-holding experience, not a problem. If you need us to call you once a week, not a problem. We can do that. We'll tailor it to suit you. We just ask for a bit of a fee on that one because it's a bit more maintenance for us. Um, people live in further afield, again, we offer the consultation and we can run through consultations over the phone. Um, we haven't done any video yet, but we could do. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, the, you know, there's a lot of support and you can always ring us. There's options to send us messages on Facebook, on Instagram, you can direct message through on the website, yeah. you can email, you know, there's loads of different ways you can get in touch with us and all those platforms are monitored. And, and some will get back to you as soon as it's picked up, pretty much, as long as it's not in the middle of the night. <laughs> so it, this isn't a case that, you know, you buy, you buy your food and you're, and you're left on your own. No, you no. support all the way through. Yeah, and even if you come back after two months and you want, you've got a few more questions about it, again, not a problem. We'll, we'll do whatever we can. Fantastic. So, you know, there are a lot of companies who've, I guess, leapt on the bandwagon of raw feeding over, over the years. But what makes Nurturing by Nature so special? Probably mum, really. You know, bringing, for, for her to be able to set it up in a way that she knows works. And then we have got the integrity, myself and Adam, to try and keep to her values. And that's what we've done all along. You know, mum wanted to be able to create a diet that's a raw diet that's affordable. So we want to be able to create or advise you on ways that you can feed raw that suit you. So that's, that was your main idea. You wanted it to be an affordable and appropriate diet. Also, we uh, source UK ingredients, so we don't get any exotic meats in. And that gives us the opportunity to be able to visit the farms or the abattoirs mm. and develop that relationship with our suppliers, um, which means we've had the same suppliers for, for many years because we've built up a relationship with them. We know how they work. They know how we work. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, the quality of the ingredients is second to none. I mean, the, the products that go into the free range minces is amazing. Absolutely amazing, the actual quality of the, the meat that ends up in them. Mm. 
And you have, <clears throat> obviously, you have here where we are today, you have, you have your own factory, your own distribution centre, so you have complete control over that quality process. Absolutely, yeah. We do buy a few other companies' bits and pieces in, mm -hmm. but we make as much as we can, um, as, as best we can. Our, um, our suppliers, like I say, are pretty good. We don't really use traders, we don't use uh, people that we don't know. We need to know the background of, the, of where this has come from. That's really important for us. So the provenance of that product. That's excellent. So <clears throat> just one, one final question. You know, why, why do some, some vets have reservations about raw food? Maybe it's just that they don't know enough about it. Um, working in practice, you do see you see different types of people. There's generally a vet is a vet because they want to help mm -hmm. and they want the pets to be good. And then this business takes over mm -hmm. and then it becomes a money making thing. So if they're selling the food then they'll be making profit out of that. Um, so that's partly where it might get mixed. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely certain of the process but um, I don't get a lot of nutrition based uh, Tuition mm -hmm. as part of their training, they have to. Those the vets do so much in the amount of time that they've got, they can't be experts at it all. Mm -hmm. um, so we reach out to practices and say, if you want to come along, we'll tell you about our food. Mm -hmm. Reassure them. I think main, mainly it's the bacterial, not giving a balanced diet mm -hmm. that they're scared of, that you're not feeding um, a balanced diet. There is actually a raw feeding veterinary society now. Okay. Um, which is great because there are a lot more vets that are up for the diet and they know it's good. Um, so I think in general there's a movement towards it and I think we've had it in the past where we've had customers come in saying my vet said I've got to stop feeding raw. I'm not going to do that, I'm going to change my vet. Yeah. So I think people have got more of a, their own voice now. Mm. And do you, do you sense that that really is mirroring our own um, understanding of, of human health and diet, how, how that we know that so many illnesses in human health are caused by, by lifestyle issues and dietary issues, and we now yeah. reflect that into the way we want to look after our pets. Definitely, yes, I think there's a, a much more awareness. There was a vet that I was talking to, um, and uh, she, I, I was talking about the raw diet, and she said, I was very concerned about the raw diet, very concerned, she said, but I've seen so many dogs have been fed on your diet and they all look amazing. So she wasn't concerned about it anymore, which was lovely, yes. absolutely lovely. And I think in our area, there actually has been a growing awareness. You still get a number of vets who are quite anti-raw, but um, usually within the practices, there tends to be somebody now who is a lot more supportive of people feeding raw food. Of course, I suppose it also might be practice policy that they're not allowed to recommend a raw food diet because they already feed, you know, a lot of vets are corporate now. Um, they've all been bought out. There's not very many independent practices left. Um, they'll have had their corporate values ploughed through and they have to sell this food because it makes this profit. <coughs> so it becomes commercial. Mm -hmm commercial factor as, as, as well as anything else. I've heard it, I've heard it said sometimes that, that one of the, the, the challenges with raw feeding is that there's a lack of, of pure independent research that goes, goes behind that. But it, but it strikes me that you only need independent research when you're feeding unusual things, things that are out of the ordinary, that are unnatural, and, and therefore you can see why a lot of commercial diets may have to see behind them, because you have to justify them. Yeah. Whereas what you're doing here clearly is, is feeding something which is entirely aligned to the natural physiology of the animal. Yep, and it's not for everyone. You know, we, we try really hard uh, for everybody to make it a suitable diet for them, but there are, there are some people that it really doesn't work for, or there's some pets that it doesn't work for, there's always alternatives out there, but overall it's the best diet that you can feed your pet. Of course, one of the biggest challenges, to be perfectly honest, is the size of your freezer. <laughs> yes, the uh, second-hand freezer uh, market in this area is uh, pretty good. Mm. Yes, but then obviously you, 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 you deliver as well as through stores, so, so presumably 
you can have deliveries to match your freezing capacity. Absolutely, yeah. So people like to come in store to see what we've got, but really the majority of the products are also available online. Um, we can offer a next day delivery service. We can send up to 24 kilos in one parcel uh, for one delivery charge. Or if you live locally, again, if you're lucky enough to live around here, we deliver for free over a certain price point. Mm. So yeah, you could have three deliveries a week if you wanted to, couldn't you? Why not? Why mm -hmm. not? If you're, if you're with a small freezer, of course you could do that. Good. Well, thank you for your, your comments today. It's been really, really interesting. I think I've got a good picture now as to as to why we get things wrong, and a very clear answer as to what we can do about it. Thank you.